Welcome to the Michigan Minds Podcast, a quick and informative analysis of today's top issues from University of Michigan faculty. My name is Caitlin Ramey. I'm an assistant professor at the Ford School of Public Policy here at Michigan. So I have three broad areas of research. Um, I study how people compare their own beliefs and behaviors to uh, those of others. I study how adopting one pro-environmental behavior affects um, people's likelihood of taking on more behaviors in the future. And then I also look at how climate change communication affects people's understanding of climate change, how it affects their behaviors, and um, also how it affects their support for climate-related policies and technologies. So some of that is studying what people often call social norms. So how um, learning about how other people act and think um, affects your own behavior. So I'm particularly interested in um, climate change and environmental behaviors. Um, and so I have some work looking at how um, being told how your own carbon footprint compares to peers might motivate people to um, reduce their carbon footprint in the future. Um, I'm working on a study now looking at electricity feedback using social norms. So you may have gotten um, different utility companies sometimes give you information about how you um, are using electricity, but also how your neighbors are doing so. Um, and so we're looking, um, do, just starting a field experiment to see um, whether the neighbors is the most important reference group or whether there's maybe other kind of comparison groups that could also get people to reduce their electricity consumption by wanting to keep up with the Joneses. And then I also, within in that I look at um, how people compare their own beliefs to others. So I do a lot of work on what I call belief superiority. So people's beliefs that their own opinions are more objectively correct than everyone else's and superior to everyone else's and um, what that means for our willingness to um, listen or work uh, across the aisle or um, consider alternative views or estimate our own knowledge. So sometimes it's about comparing people's behaviors to others. So having people fill out report information about how they act and the things that they're doing to try and um, reduce their own carbon footprint and then giving them information about how that stacks up against um, peers. But with the beliefs, what we have people do is actually just rate their attitudes on given topics and then have them say how much more correct they think their beliefs are to other people's views on this topic. And so we get measures of both like what they believe, but also how they think that stacks up. And we use that combined um, information to assess how superior they feel about um, whether it's an environmental issue or any other issue. You know, climate change is one of these really complex issues that's really hard for us to wrap our heads around. And so for a lot of us, we have maybe very low levels of information about it or you know, we have some inkling, but it's kind of based in a shallow kind of way. And what that means is that climate change is something that's really open to both misunderstandings and misinformation. Um, it's, it's not like everybody has their own really in-depth working knowledge of this. And so the way we communicate about climate change can have um, a really outsized effect on what people believe about it. Um, and so some of my work has looked at ways to communicate about climate change that um, don't just play into the political polarization that we see around it. That's one of the issues is that, you know, we have camps based on our political views and climate change has kind of fallen into that trap. Um, and so it can be an uphill battle to talk to people because they don't want to listen to you um, if you are on the wrong team. Um, and so there's a lot of distress there. But there are ways to talk about climate change that don't feed that so much. So for example, um, talking about climate change as akin to a medical disease seems to be a potential way to talk about climate change, to kind of communicate that you know, there are lots of situations where we have to make decisions in when we don't have all the information, when there's uncertainty about what exactly is going to happen, um, but that, you know, the experts are, you know, you can get a second opinion about things and people are agreeing about what's been happening so far. And so um, using that kind of a frame can can be a little bit depolarizing, which is helpful. We also find that, you know, sometimes what people react to is not so much the idea of climate science, but the solutions that are proposed to deal with it. Um, a lot of these solutions are really big government solutions. So if you're politically conservative, that might not be, um, you know, a, a type of action that you want to take on. And so talking about um, 
you know, other solutions like private sector initiatives or um, technologies that could help climate change may be a, a way to, you know, talk about the science without it being immediately aversive if you don't like big government. I think it's really important to look through the communication sense because people, people's understanding is so shallow that there, there are lots of opportunities, but lots of risks in the way that we communicate this. And so I think if we don't pay careful attention to how we're communicating about climate change, we could do more damage and get um, people to really, you know, this is an issue that's very easy for people to ignore if they, they're not seeing the effects in their daily lives, or if they're not recognizing the effects in their daily lives. And so I think it's really important to convey accurately what is going on and what can be expected in ways that um, uh, mesh with people's existing values and the things that they care about, because it will affect those things. A lot of times people assume that if you get, if you can just get people to do one behavior, that that means that they're then going to become an environmental person and then they're going to do all these other good behaviors. You just get them to recycle and they'll, um, you know, then they'll start composting and they'll switch out their lights and they'll support a carbon tax. And sometimes people make the opposite assumption. They say like, why are you telling people to like not use plastic straws? That's such a waste of time. Like you're just undermining support for carbon tax and big meaningful changes that are are what we actually need. Um, and so there's these wild assumptions that go in both directions. The research is really mixed in terms of what ends up happening. So this is called pro-environmental spillover, just one behavior spillover into the other. Some studies find evidence for positive spillover. So if you get people to do that first behavior, they're more likely to take on a second behavior. Other studies show negative spillover. So um, we've done a lot of work to try and figure out when and where those occur. It seems like positive spillover is more likely if you can get people to um, think about the intrinsic joy they get from the behaviors that so actually enjoying doing the behavior can lead them to want to take on secondary behaviors. Um, things like guilt um, might not be so good that might need to lead to more negative spillover because people just don't enjoy that. Um, and so the, the method that you that interveners use to get people to do the first behavior may affect their likelihood of doing others. So when I've been involved with nonprofits and governments, it's usually been to help them with um, interventions that they're trying to do around behavior change. So the Tennessee Department of Energy wanted to try and get people to um, reduce their um, phantom load use, which is like when you have things plugged in to sockets that aren't being used? How can you get people to unplug those? Because that's a waste of energy. Um, or I worked with Keep America Beautiful. They wanted to assess the effectiveness of a recycling campaign. And so that's all kind of things where people want to do something that's policy relevant, like reducing energy use or increasing recycling. But they realize that the, like, the people that they're trying to change are people and they have behaviors that they're, individual behaviors that they're trying to change. And so, um, what I do is kind of try and help them shape interventions that are based on the psychology of what we know about what motivates people to change their behavior and avoid some of the pitfalls that we know that campaigns sometimes do. So one of the big things, the bad things that the people sometimes do is to talk about how everybody's doing the wrong thing um, because that makes it seem like it's a bigger problem, which um, it may be, but telling the public that everybody's doing the wrong thing actually just makes them think, well, everybody else is doing this bad thing. And so I should join in too. So if I want to be like my peers, I should also waste energy and not recycle and all that stuff. So that's a good thing to avoid doing. Um, and that's like the type of thing I help try and guide people with. A, a lot of the issues that I look at that are policy or political issues and people are very quick to get into fights about those and be really kind of aggressive and trying to convince and persuade people. And they often try and use, you know, the reasons that they think that this is important or that they think that this policy is awful or great um, in order to convince others. And that is failing to recognize that those other people may not share the same values or may not, may have different priorities. It's not that they have, they just don't have information. It's that they actually believe something else. Um, and so I think it's really important if you're gonna try and persuade someone else to first kind of understand where they're coming from and try and understand what their values and the things that they think are important are before you try to persuade them to your view. I think going at it in a really, a, telling people that they're wrong is, is never something that's super effective. I think giving people information in terms of that they care about can be effective, um, but kind of shaming and scolding is not the, the way to go.
a lot of my work is on this idea of belief superiority. So, and what we see is that people who people who hold more extreme positions on any given topic tend to feel more superior about their beliefs on that topic. And people who feel really superior about their beliefs are really hard to budge. They are much more likely to engage in selective attention, which means they're only paying attention to information that agrees with their point of view. They're, they're very good at ignoring information that disagrees with them or people. Um, they tend to derogate people who disagree with them. They think that they know a lot more than they actually do on a given topic. They overestimate their knowledge. Um, and luckily, that seems to be a fairly small proportion of people out there um, who, who think that their views are, are highly superior. And so I think sometimes I think if you're trying to persuade groups of people, um, you need to pick your battles and not worry about those people who hold their beliefs with more superiority because it's very hard to change those people. But there's a lot of movable people in the middle who may not um, have strong beliefs or maybe more open to alternatives. And I think you know, directing energy there is often the most um, fruitful way to go. If you're thinking, if, you know, if you're out there and you're trying to change people's behavior, I think it's really important to think about not just the immediate behavior that they, that you're targeting, but also how that could affect other behaviors and try and help people do things in a way that's sustainable and not just environmentally sustainable, but like that they'll repeat them in the, and take them on to other future behaviors. So helping people to enjoy new behaviors or to find value in them um, and not guilt trip them into it is, is a good way to go. I think, um, you know, communicating in ways that is in line with people's values um, and figuring, knowing your audience, both in terms of how extreme those attitudes are and what they care about is really important. And just really talking to your peers about, this is not something we really talked about that much, but peer-to-peer -peer communication is really important. So if we're thinking about social norms, we do things that we think other people are doing, and we don't do things that we think other people aren't doing. And one of those things is talking about climate change. So one of the really, if you are somebody who cares about climate change, one of the best things you can do is talk about it with your friends and neighbors and family members because they may be under the impression that you don't care because you haven't talked about it. Um, and we can dispel that particular myth because it turns out a lot of people really do care and are really concerned. Related to the idea of, of spillover is I have some work looking at um, whether individual behaviors can undermine support for policies. Um, so there's often a fear that if you talk about these individual behaviors, people won't support policies. And this also comes up when people think about um, technologies when it comes to climate change. So we're learning about um, geoengineering, which is like technological approaches to try and manipulate the Earth's climate on purpose to, to counteract climate change. There's a fear that learning about that will undermine people's support for government action. Um, and I think, I think a key thing we've learned in the last few years is that yes, those things can happen. Those crowding out effects can happen. So learning about individual behaviors or um, learning about technologies can kind of lead people to think that climate change is kind of taken care of and they don't need to do the hard or support the hard work of government action. But that that really only happens when people are under the misunderstanding that those things will take care of everything. If you correct that belief and tell people like, this is a good step, but it's not sufficient. We really need more. Like the magnitude of these is not gonna be enough to take care of this issue. Then the crowding out effects go away. So I think if you are someone who's either communicating about technologies or thinking about how individual behaviors might affect policy, I think the key thing there is just to convey that like these are good steps in the right direction they're not good enough on their own. So this is part of a, a tool in a toolbox, not a silver bullet. Thank you for listening to the Michigan Minds podcast, a production of the University of Michigan. Join the conversation on social media with hashtag UMichImpact.